And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to welcome tonight the incredible Deborah Goodrich Royce, here to give us the inside scoop on her brand new book, Reef Road. Deborah, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. Hi, Sarah. I am so glad to see you and to be here with you tonight. We are here in different corners of New England, but it's raining everywhere. So it's a perfect night to talk about thrillers. Um, so Reef Road is a book that I started writing three plus years ago, but it, it's a book for me that really was marinating for a long time. My real mother's best friend was murdered in 1948 when my mother and her friend were 12 years old. This happened in Pittsburgh and it has remained to this day, all these 75 years later, an unsolved crime. So I was in the stream of my other books and I was on a book tour in March of 2020 when we all know what happened, the world shut us down. And I happened to be in Florida at that time. And I thought, well, if I, am going to ever really find the time to research this actual murder. That was the moment. So the thing that's interesting with a very old, let me make sure this goes off, a very old murder case is that there's tons of stuff online. And I don't know why I was surprised, but once I started researching it, there were dozens of newspaper articles that had been uploaded over the years. And, you know, I've always wondered who are these uploading gremlins who <laughs> get a hold of all these old Pittsburgh newspapers and pull those articles up. But however that happens, they were there. So this big research project began for me. And as I was going along, I really made the decision that I didn't want to write it as nonfiction. I tend to write fiction anyway. And I think you can get more to the truth of what you want to say through fiction than you actually can in nonfiction sometimes because Ooh. nonfiction is very married to all of the facts, meaning by facts, I mean details. Whereas with fiction, you can get to the truth of a theme. And I wanted to explore generational trauma more than I wanted to explore anything else. So Reef Road is a twisty thriller that takes place in Palm Beach, where I was when I was writing it, in that COVID lockdown period of spring of 2020. And it's a, a tale of two women, a writer who's obsessed with the murder of her mother's best friend, and a younger woman whose husband and children disappear about three weeks into the lockdown. And because of COVID restrictions, she can't follow them. They are, they are tracked getting on a plane to Buenos Aires and the skies have been closed. So you start to toggle back and forth between the two women and see what one has to do with the other. And as you said, this book toggles back and forth between the viewpoint of the wife and the viewpoint of thoughts from a writer. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk more about that, Deborah, because um, I have a lot of questions myself and I know everybody here does too. So I just want to welcome everyone because we are broadcasting simultaneously to six different destinations across Facebook and YouTube. So hey, mystery and thriller loving friends, no matter where you're watching from, you are in the right place. This is the right time. It is a mystery Monday because Mondays can be murder. We're going to make them a little less painful for you. So if you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, we're so happy you're here. Welcome, friends. Here's the drill. Every Monday, I give you my handpicked featured authors, and you get to ask them anything. So ask Deborah about Reef Road, this incredible 75-year-old unsolved murder of her mother's best friend that remains unsolved today. The viewpoints of the wife and the writer. Is Deborah the writer? We need to know. We have a lot of questions. So we're going to get right on into them. Anissa, welcome to the conversation. She says, hello, Sarah and Deborah. I love hearing more about Reef Road. And Anissa commented yesterday and said she loves DGR. So I'm going to be calling you DGR from now on. Yeah. <laughs> that is kind of sticking as a nickname. I um, When I published, I put my maiden name back in with my name, uh, 
it's here, Deborah Goodrich Royce, because I acted under Goodrich and I've been married under Royce for a long while, but I felt like I wanted to kind of, I mean, this is a, a female thing primarily. I wanted to really meld the different sides of myself and knit them back together uh, a little more cohesively. Interesting story. In, I think it was May, I was in Winnetka doing a book event and I got an email from a man who is a journalist who said he was writing an article for a Pittsburgh publication about the real murder. And he was Googling around and my name came up. So I said, that's so funny. I'm on my way to Pittsburgh to do a, a book talk. So we met in a parking lot and my mom was like, are you sure you wanna do that? You wanna meet this man in a car in a parking lot? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't really think about that. But I met him and as we're talking about why I have an interest in the real murder, obviously due to my mother, I, I asked him what his interest was. And he said, his mother dated the brother and the brother was and is still the primary suspect. Isn't that oh my crazy? God, his mother dated the suspect? Yes. <gasps> oh my God. So I can't wait for his article to come out about this. Yes, we're all going to wait now for that article because you never hear about that side of the true crime. Wow. Right. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Um, Sharon's joining us from Minnesota. Hi, Sharon. Welcome to the conversation. Um, Sharon, another Sharon's joining us from YouTube saying, hi, Sarah and Deborah. Hi, Sharon. Welcome to the conversation to you as well. We have a mystery user saying, good evening, Sarah and Deborah. Very happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Thank you for joining us. And Nisa wants to know, Deborah, which character changed the most from your first draft to the final version? And did he or she become a better person? That is an excellent question. So I don't know, many of the story and plot points evolved a great deal in the two years of writing it. Um, I'm not sure the characters change so much. I found things in them that I liked very much in the writer I, I like her relationship with her dog and in the wife, I like her relationship with her children. There are many things about them, uh, each of them that aren't very likable. Uh, I, the, I think what evolved was the actions and choices that the characters made in the course of those two years of writing it. Ooh. Tell us more how, how, what you mean by that and how, Deborah. So I knew at the beginning I wanted to have this writer ob obsessed with the murder of her mother's best friend. What I didn't know was quite how uh, obsessive a character she would become in general. I mean, I think it's a defining characteristic of the writer as she exists now that she is very cerebral and she's a bit of a research nut and she is obsessed with arcane murder statistics and um, strange facts. And that was a lot of fun, allowing that aspect of my personality to kind of run amok. I, uh, I don't have time to be that obsessive, but it was really a fascinating thing to kind of take the barriers off of that and allow myself to go down that rabbit hole. And with the wife, um, she is a character who's very much ruled by her desires, her longings, what, uh, she, she goes after what she wants. And it was also fun to write her to allow that aspect to really run amok. She's the the wife is a noir character. And if you if you know film noir, the the women are always uh, up to something. You really have to keep a close watch on on the woman. And she's very much a noir character. So she is ruled by her passions, shall we say, much more than the writer. 
Well, as a huge noir fan and a classic movies fan, um, I know exactly the kind of female character that we need to keep an eye on. So I, I loved that. And I hadn't realized, I hadn't thought of it like that, but now that makes sense why I resonated, <laughs> why I, I resonated with that. Um, I noticed that you said that the that you didn't realize how obsessive the writer character was going to be as an as obsessive writer. <laughs> I also resonated with that, Deborah. Yeah, it, and it was fun to write that. There's a very meta aspect to the writer's sections. She, um, the meta meaning self-referential. So the writer is in a sense having much more of a direct dialogue with the reader than is often happens in, in novels. I mean, if you think of theater, there's that that fourth wall that the actors do not cross, but occasionally in kind of postmodern theater they do, and in postmodern novels they do. So as I was writing the writer, I, I was playing with, well, how far can I go with talking to the reader with, um, and at a certain point, you and I were talking earlier about writing, you have to write what you're called to write. You have to just go for it. And then rather than holding yourself back, you know, find out from your editor, is this working? Are you absolutely crazy or <laughs> what's happening here? Mm, I love that. Uh, yes. And sometimes because when you're sitting there and it's just you and the laptop, you could really start to feel crazy. I mean, you can really start to think, does this even make sense outside of this tortured brain? <laughs> And it's, it's hard to know. I, um, and I think that is part of what writing is, is just yeah. putting it out there. I think yeah. so many people could write if they just had the confidence to put it out there. We do often self-check. You know, we have that thought. We have that impulse. We have, I once read, there's a great quotation about genius, and I'm not claiming genius, but just you know, insert that word for a minute, that genius really, it isn't having an idea that no one else has had. It's having an idea and putting it out there when other people say, oh my God, I thought that too. I, that resonates. I have felt that too. So I, I think there's a certain amount of confidence required or just boldness, shall we say. Yes. Yes. Because how many times do, you know, do we all say, oh, I had that idea for that product or that book or that movie right. or whatever, and something holds us back. And I, and, and so it's, there is a certain, you know, just being willing, whether, whatever that is to, you know, courage or hubris or whatever to put it out there. And so, yeah, this make this makes so much sense. Um, I think I you have to be willing to fall on your face. I think that's really what it is. And mm -hmm. when you write a book, as long as one person gets what you're saying, you feel like, all right, by extension, there will be other people like that. It doesn't have to be everybody. And of course, it can't be everybody. But it will connect with somebody. But also, Deborah, I, I mean, everybody, Deborah is a former, is formerly an actress. I mean, Deborah, is it that same willingness to put yourself out there to, to quote, fall on your face, to look foolish, to get rejected for the role? Is, is, is that, did that help you in some way to train you yeah. to put yourself out there? Yes. And I think if you don't, you, you, you never cross to the next level. If you look at I think of one of the greatest actresses of the last 50 years would be Meryl Streep. Yes. And if you look at her body of work, she, whatever she did, she did completely, absolutely completely. And I think that's what's required with writing as well. I love that. I love that. Heather, welcome to the conversation. Joining us from Roswell, Georgia. Great to have you. John, joining us from Northeast Ohio. John, welcome. Always a pleasure to have you. I um, went to college in Painesville, Ohio, John. What town are you in? John, tell us what town you're in. D D yeah. Detective Deborah is reporting for duty. Um, oh, our mystery user is revealing himself. He is George Beach, joining us from Houston, Texas, from Murder by the Book. Great to have you, George. Diane, welcome to the conversation. Joining us from YouTube. Diane wants to know, Deborah, what was your inspiration for collecting the arcane murder statistics? 
Well, gosh, I mean, it is interesting. I think so many of us are interested in that now more openly than at one time. Um, one, I think so much is available. We now have these, you know, podcasts and shows about true crime. We, I mean, there are so many examples out there. So I think when the murder of my mother's best friend happened in 48, there was a certain amount of information that circulated primarily in Pittsburgh, and then eventually it died out. If you go X number of decades later to a somewhat similar case, that of John Benet Ramsey, that went viral over the whole United States because, you know, we have news channels 24 7, we have access to all this stuff. So I think I was thinking about all of that and really, once you start down that rabbit hole, you just start finding more and more, including there's a section in the book that the writer talks about the barfing habits of sharks, which, believe it or not, is somehow going to twist you back into the story. And it just tickled me to write that section because it was just so weird. And I found this information and there it was. And I thought, I'm putting it in the book. I love that. The book, by the way, y'all, is out now and you can order from our favorite woman-owned independent bookstore that is, of course, Murder by the Book. And the good folks there at the bookstore will ship it out to you tomorrow. So no matter where you're watching from, on Facebook or YouTube, here is that link to click and order so you can get your hands on Reef Road and immerse yourself in the world of the world the minds and words and worlds of the writer and the wife and the two boys who discover a severed human hand on the beach, which is how our book opens. So here is that link. So click, click, click and pre-order, uh, sorry, order you guys and get your hands on Reef Road as well. Diana is saying she loves noir and classic movies. Yay, Diane, me too. They're I so do too. And I, you know, I think it really bears rewatching so many of them. At the beginning of, of writing Reef Road, you asked about inspiration. I'm sitting there in Florida and I rewatched uh, Body Heat, what, which was a movie made not 10 minutes away from where I was writing this book. And it's a later film noir, but it's so good. Kathleen Turner, William Hurt. And it really, it is steeped in that feeling of, Florida being hot and oppressive and muggy. And there's a great quotation that a lot of people say Carl Hyacin said about Florida. I don't think he did. I think it was really Somerset Mom who said it about the French Riviera in the 1920s. But the expression is, it's a sunny place for shady people. And I wanted that mood to really permeate this book. I love knowing that. Um, thank you for sharing that, Deborah. Um, and it, that that makes so much sense. I love when books really weave in, you know, the the vibe of a place, and also even the weather, because yeah, that steamy, um, you know, hot, cluster, you know, claustrophobic feeling. It's just so so. It's so true. Um, Diane was to know: Did the did you write the double narrative separately, the wife and the writer's thoughts? or as it came to you? Great question. I tend to write nonlinear books and I write them as the reader reads them. For me, I do a lot of notes about the separate timelines and or separate voices. So I have extensive notes going in one place or another. But as I'm writing the book, um, and I jokingly, not so jokingly, say maybe it's because I was an actress on a soap opera and they always have cliffhangers, you know, da 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 on your left, you know, for the next thing coming. But I love the way one chapter ties into the little tease of the next, including the, the barfing of the sharks, which very much ties into what comes <laughs> next. Uh, the way that you wouldn't expect. So I do write it as you read it. And I've talked to other writers who do not. They, you know, they write one section and then they write another. Um, not me. And Nisa would like to know, do your characters lead you or do you lead them? Do you, do they talk to you constantly? 
Oh, they lead me. I mean, it starts at the beginning where I'm trying to formulate who they are, aspects of what they're about, what um, what makes them tick, what they want, what they're trying to get at, you know, colors of their personality. And then they they step in and and lead you along. And that might take a little bit. It might be a frustrated period where you're not quite getting. And Sarah and I were talking before we were live about the element of time. And I think time is so important in any creative work. And I once heard someone describing music, and I'm not a musician, but the way it was said that, you know, when you look at music written, not only are the notes noted, but the silences are noted. There's an importance to the silences that come be, be, between the notes that creates the rhythm and the actual melody um, of, of how it goes together. And I think with writing, there's the process where you're sitting there and writing at your desk, and then there's everything else where you're walking, you're in the shower, you're, you're sleeping. I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and make a note. And I think problems percolate in your brain. God knows mine do. And then sometimes the solution comes when you don't even know you're thinking about it. And if you're rushing too much to get a book out on a timeline, it, you can miss things, I think. Oh, Deborah, I love that. And I love the analogy of the notes and the stillness, um, the notes and the silence, um, the space between the notes. That's so beautifully, beautifully said. Um, thank you. Um, that, I mean, I just, that's really resonating. So then that's so beautifully said. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Diana is saying, Deb, you look abs absolutely gorgeous. Sarah is radiant. Deb is glowing. Murder is good for the skin. <laughs> well, just to let you know, Diane, I haven't actually murdered anybody. <laughs> well, maybe, well, maybe, you know, you're onto something. There's some cathartic process of really looking into things like this. You know, you're just, you're going for it. You're just going for it. Exactly. I love that. I love that. Um, uh, I want to make sure. Oh, this. Oh, my goodness. So many great comments. We're going to get to all of them. Um, oh, OK. D uh, Diane has a really good one. And she wants to know. Um, she said oh, first, she said it is our own take on the idea that separates it from others. That's a really good point. She wants to know, how do you prepare for a new for a new manuscript? She goes on to ask, do you have any writing rituals? If so, what are they? Yeah, Deborah, get let us into your creative process because I love the idea of this stillness and this marinating and the concept of time. So I generally write in one place. So I'm very Pavlovian. I am a, I respond to the external stimuli of sitting in the space. Uh, I generally write at a big table. I spread things out at the table and there is something to entering into the place. Um, I try to do it at a regular time. I try to do it in the mornings. If I can't do the morning, I'll do the afternoon. I'm not any good at night. And that's really a question of knowing yourself and when you really thrive in, in thinking. And I will also get up from time to time and maybe go get coffee or go put clothes in the dryer or folding stuff. You know, it's very weird. It, um, I don't go off on major projects, but even walking to fold a load of towels sort of, it keeps you in the headspace. What you don't want to do is get up and walk around and run into somebody in your house where they start asking you a million questions. You're like, I'm writing right now. I'm actually thinking. Um, so, you know, those are some habits. And in terms of ideas, um, one thing I can say, I am a later in life published author and people have said, you know, do you ever get 
writer's block. And I'm like, well, yeah, if you consider the first 50 years of my life, I had a little writer's block. But uh, I really got started writing. I was a, an actress in my 20s. And then I was an editor in my 30s, a story editor, not a film editor. I wasn't cutting film. I was working with writers. And I wrote a screenplay in my 40s. And you know, joined different writing groups and then really pushed it to the next level in my 50s. And so for me, what I would say, there is something to age and experience where I I have felt I've had more to draw on. And then going back to this idea of confidence, I think I've had from writing groups more confidence in my own voice at I think if if you are a writer, there's something to being in a writing group with kind people, with supportive mm. people, where you start to recognize what it is about the way you express yourself that resonates with others. I think what you're saying is really important for a couple of different reasons. There's so much pressure in and and fetishization and glamorization of getting things done fast and getting things done young. And I think this whole concept of you know what we're talking about of the space between notes and the silence between notes and the ripeness and the richness of allowing one's work to marinate. Um, and allowing one's life experience to to ripen and marinate and to pour all of that into the page because there is no need to think, you know, these 30 under 30 lists or whatever. There's no need to rush into doing it, that everything that you're doing and learning and seeing and experiencing and conversations that you're having and relationships that you're exploring are all in informing the work that you will do and the life that you will lead. And there's something really lovely about that and, and knowing that everything, there's time. You have time. <laughs> if you're lucky, you have time. And if you don't, you don't. And you don't know. <laughs> that you don't know. We've all lost young friends. There's That is an unknown. But odds are, if, if you're not going to meet with an early demise, if you're under 30, you're probably going to live another 70 years at least. You know, statistically, we're living longer and longer. And um, on what? Well, not. It's an extraordinary time. Yes. I mean, that is an unknown. Uh, but as you go along, I think you understand things more and more. What you understand now about human beings is certainly, I would hope, more than you understood 10 years ago. Mm. Definitely. For, for me, for sure. Um, George is suggesting a, a David Attenborough documentary, The Barfing of the Sharks. Yes, I can I can see that, George. Absolutely. That is a good I, that is a good idea. Uh, Diana's laughing with us. I love that. Um, George wants to know on a serious note, do you ever find yourself overwhelmed by all the thoughts running through your mind at any time? Does it make you feel like you miss out on daily events in any way? Great question. That is a very good question. So I tend to have an anxious mind mm. and I have all of my adult life uh, tried to have a morning practice of one kind or another. It doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are, your lack of religious beliefs. There are all kinds of morning practices. So I find for me, if I take time first thing in the morning before I get on my phone, before I look at the world news, to do something, and it's been different things. It might be a reading um, from an inspirational book. It might be of a spiritual path or another, and then a little meditation. I'm not a great meditator. Uh, <laughs> and after all these years, I have not become one of those people who meditates for an hour. But you know, I'm I'm in there for the the ten minute, and I feel like I've. I have a certain consciousness to the way I've started my day. Another thing I'll do is an yoga, physical yoga or physical exercise or walking, I think is a great mental reset. And then looking, looking around. So I totally get overwhelmed by my thoughts. And that's usually in the middle of the night, uh, two, three, four in the morning. The normal thoughts like I forgot to take out the garbage become really that the world is on the precipice of nuclear annihilation because 
I forgot to take out the garbage. That's what the magnitude feels like to me in the middle of the night. Yes, Deborah, as someone who also struggles with anxiety and always has, I also also um, suffer struggle with those late night panic panic spots. What I do in the middle of the night is different. I don't do a spiritual practice in the middle of the night. I read a book. And I read fiction because I don't want to be reading nonfiction where I'm underlining stuff and and getting super awake. Um, I'm just taking anxious thoughts and moving them sideways till eventually I'll go to sleep again. That is a very good tip. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing all of this, by the way. Um, Deborah, I want to talk about, oh, Diana, so do you read within your own genre? If so, what, um, oh wait, I, I actually just lost it. These comments are coming so fast. I'm missing them. She wants to know if you read within your own genre, if so, what, um, what books have you been reading lately? This is what I have right on my uh, right next to me, Thicker Than Water by Megan Collins. I'm, I'm reading right now. I'm enjoying it very much. I do. I read across genres. So I read pretty broadly, primarily fiction, hmm. um, I, not as much nonfiction. I read some. Anissa wants to know if you were to write in another genre, what genre would that be and why? Anissa, ask him. Anissa's in the librarian, so she's coming in with all the good questions. I know. I love you, Anissa. I can't wait to see you again. Um, I think I would write <laughs> in literary fiction. I do think my books are literary. Um, some people call them literary thrillers. And sometimes, Keeping the thriller plot line is a lot to sustain. My newest book that I'm working on is very literary. And I keep thinking, am I pasting this thriller plot on it a little bit too much? But I also like things that are funny. And I wrote a screenplay, gosh, 20 years ago with a dear friend. And it's just now getting some interest. We can't do anything now because there's a Writer's Guild strike. But oddly, you know, to get this interest now. And um, it's a comedy. It's a very dark comedy. Uh, mm -hmm. Picture Othello meets Bridesmaids. And, but I also think th my thrillers are funny. I, I think books, I, we'll go back to the barfing of sharks. It's meant to be funny. <laughs> you know, you should laugh. Uh, so let's go to movies. Hitchcock is really kind of my idol in, in the genre. Uh, I think his movies were, they had the tension and they had the suspense, but they were very funny. They were very funny. Even, I also love Hitchcock and I'm thinking of North by Northwest with Cavie, Cary Grant and Ava Marie Saint. There are some really funny scenes, um, that dry sense of humor. Um, Anissa, thank you for the great question. Margaret, welcome to the conversation. She's joining us while she makes dinner. So good to have you. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, George saying thank you for the good points. Melissa joining us from Australia, just joining us. Thank you for, for tuning in. Um, Margaret saying, when you see me reading a book a day, be warned that I'm going through a nuclear annihilation phase. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. all of us. I get it. Totally. Um, I'm already saying we, we stand with SEG AFTRA. Yes. SEG yeah. AFTRA strong. Absolutely. Anissa saying very inter interesting answer. And she can't wait to see you again. Margaret saying Hitchcock feels like British humor to her. Totally. Well, yes, yes. I mean, but it's very dry. Think about Rear Window. I mm. just rewatched it. Uh, and it, I, I mean, it's so tight, the humor, and it, it is very dry. My favorite is, there's a whole sequence, and of course, it's the 1950s. So Grace Kelly uh, is going to come to her boyfriend's house, Jimmy Stewart's house, and seduce him. They've never slept together, which, of course, nobody slept together in the 1950s. Ha, ha, ha. And she brings a little suitcase by Mark Cross, which was a very fancy uh, uh, leather goods line. And hit, this cop comes in, there's a whole scene with a cop and the cop keeps looking at the suitcase because 
he knows she's going to spend the night. And after he leaves, um, Grace Kelly says to Jimmy Stewart, did he think I stole that case? And it's hilarious because, of course, that's not at all what he thought. He's it's there's, it's filled with sexual innuendo, but they don't have to hit it over the head. And that's why it's funny. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's very well said. Um, you don't have to. It, right. It's a very sly wink and nod. Sensation. Very sly. So good. Um, thank you for the, thank you for that. Um, Diane saying she loves Rare Window. Kelly and Stuart are magic. Absolutely. Um, so many great ones. Okay. Last question from Sharon. Without any spoilers, do you have a favorite scene or chapter in your book, Deborah? I loved the prologue. <clears throat> I loved the writing the prologue. It, the two boys discover a severed human hand and I got to write. It's funny. I got to write surfer dialogue and I, I had surfer consultants in the shape of my son-in-law and his brother. But there's a moment where uh, they they find this, this hand and one brother says to the other, dude, dude, do you think it's real? And the other brother answers, the seagulls do. Because the seagulls are hovering over trying to eat it. Uh, so I loved writing that. I also loved the first time you, you're really hearing the writer where she says she grew up in the shadow of a dead girl, a girl she'd never met. And uh, you, you come to understand right away that this, this murder of a person before she was even born has cast this pall over her life and really formed her. There's incredible stuff out there now on epigenetics, this idea that we are somehow touched, shaped, formed by traumas that happened generations back. They're studying it in large sweeping scales. Mm. Holocaust victims would be a great example. Descendants of, of Native Americans and that terrible genocide. Um, Black Americans mm. descended of, you know, all those years of slavery. Those things carry down. And, and it happens at this individual level in families. And I hope that if we study this a little more, we might start to understand more about anxiety, trauma, addiction, uh, mm. depression, things that... Um, we understand in one way, but I think not fully. I think it's like addiction are so intractable. Um, mm. You know, there are the anonymous programs, which can be life changing. But you know, these are, are big societal problems that uh, I'd love to see <laughs> explored in some other ways. Absolutely, really, really great points here. Um, Y'all, the book is out now. So order your copy of Reef Road from our favorite woman-owned independent bookstore, Murder by the Book, and the good folks at the bookstore will ship you your copy tomorrow. Deborah Goodrich Royce, thank you so much for joining us and giving us the inside scoop. This has been a fascinating and fabulous conversation. And I look forward to hosting you when your next book is out. Thank you. And I look forward to hosting you next year at the Ocean House in person. Talk about your book, Sarah. I would be honored to chat with you anytime and anywhere, Deborah. And Nisa saying, thank you, ladies. This has been such a fun conversation. And Nisa, always a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Diane saying, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Deborah. What a fun evening. Have a wonderful night. Enjoy your week. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I hope your week is off to a killer start. And I will see you next week for Mystery Monday. Take good care until then. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone.